Previously on the fan of history, the Assyrian Empire is going down fast. Egypt is divided and weak, and Urartu and Israel are strong. So it's time to talk about what happened in the 750s BC. I'm the fan of history and I'm just a fan of history, so if you find something wrong, please tell me, give me a source and I get to learn more. Before you watch this, you should probably watch the great civilizations of the world in 800 BC to set the stage, but we are getting quite far from 800 BC now though. So Sarduri II is the king of Urartu and Urartu is the strongest state in the Near East. This is the most powerful ruler in the Western world. Urartu is roughly proto-Armenia. We have this guy's annals, what he wrote about his life. And he is the seventh king of Urartu. The biggest concern of Urartu is their common border with the failing Assyrian Empire. This is a map of the borderland. Uh, Urartu has one of its strongest kings ever. And Assyria has a really weak king. But there is the Turtanu, the field marshal of the Assyrian army, Shamshi Ilu, and he is controlling this border from the Assyrian side. On the field of battle, Assyria will still win, but Urartu is hiding behind fortresses and mountains and assembling allies to take on Assyria in a final battle to kick out the Assyrians uh, from Assyria to eliminate them completely. But they're doing quite a good job of it themselves, because in 790, uh, 759 BC, Assyria is in revolt again. This revolt has been going on for quite some time. And it's only stopped because of a plague that sweeps the land. So there's plague, there's civil war. Uh, the king is Ashurdan III, but he doesn't do much of value. And in fact, Assyria is pretty much in chaos until 755 BC. So, woe to the mighty, oh how they have fallen. In 757 BC, the office of Archon in Athens, uh, Athens is changed. It's reduced to 10 years earlier, the Archon was Archon for life. Um, the first to possess this new office is Karops. It's very unclear dating on this. It might have happened in 753 BC, and of course it might all be mythical, but it probably is not. There is some sort of crisis going on in Attica, that's the peninsula where Athens is. And uh, you will notice in archaeology there is a sharp decline of Attic pottery overseas, and there is also a strong influx of Corinthian pottery in Attica. There seems to be fewer imports from abroad as well in Attica. So, uh, while the other city-states, there is a population explosion going on in Greece, but it's not happening really in Athens in this decade, and there will be problems in Athens going forward. In 755 BC, Ashadan III dies. So, his reign was pretty much civil war, plagues, eclipses, bad things, but this is the last king that could do anything, although he didn't do much, but things will get even worse for the Assyrians. 755 BC, Ashurnirari V takes over the throne. Uh, I've read two different things about him. Either he was the son of Ashurdan III, or his brother, that is the son of Adad-Nirari III, it's been 27 years since Adad Nirari III died, but, so this guy might very well be a younger son of him. Uh, the year this happens is unclear as well. The Assyrian sources are now almost gone. He's the weakest of all the kings of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, I would say. There is not a king in the 300 years of the empire that is worse than this guy. Because he has lost all his power, the state is now completely ruled by the nobles. And Shamshi Ilu is the most powerful, but remember, Shamshi Ilu has been around since the days of Adad Nirari III, the early days of Adad Nirari III. So he's getting old at this point. 
In 754 BC, Sarduri II of Urartu decides to use this, and he wins a victory against Assyria. The Assyrians fail to mention this encounter. Uh, but Sarduri says uh, that he crushed the army of Ashurnirari the fifth in the district of Arme or Urme. This is probably in Shubria. He takes the city of Inkiria, but uh, I don't know where any of these places are. And Urartian place names is also always uh, very hard to decipher. Uh, I have no reason to doubt Sarduri II here. I think he beat up uh, the Assyrians well. And remember, he's making a great pincer movement on Assyria. His influence in Syria is increasing, and he's also spreading eastwards around uh, Lake Urmia. So soon, uh, Urartu will envelop Assyria from the north, northwest, and northeast. In some year between 755 and 745, this guy, Pulu, becomes the governor of Kala, the capital of Assyria. We don't really know what year this happened, but I had to mention it somewhere. So being the governor of the capital means that this guy is the noble with the best ability to control the Assyrian king. Uh, there are claims that this is the younger brother of Ashurnirari V, but uh, I can't remember any kingly brothers doing anything important in the early empire. So for example, what did the brothers of Chalmanes III do? Nobody knows. So uh, this is quite an important job for a kingly brother, and I don't think he was a king's brother. We'll talk more about this guy. In 754 BC, Polydorus becomes one of the kings of Sparta. I've been looking all over for Greek events that can be dated, and it is extremely hard. The Urartian and the Assyrian sources are so datable compared to the Greek sources. So this guy might have been the king in Sparta in 741 BC, or he might just be a legend. But he's a member of the Agiad dynasty. Remember, there are two kings in Sparta at all times. Egypt is weak and divided. There is a 22nd dynasty pharaoh of Libyan descent, Shoshenk V. He lives in Tanis, but uh, very few people listen to him and take orders from him. There are at least four other independent rulers in Egypt, some of which call themselves the pharaoh. So Egypt has been dirtling around in splendid isolation since the Sea Peoples. This has actually been going on then for over 400 years. But the Dark Ages are over, the Iron Age is here, Egypt is falling behind, Egypt has no iron for example. And soon Egypt, being a very rich land, will be invaded both from the south and the north. The southerners, they will make an effort to become Egyptians, just like the Libyans have done. But the northerners, they worship only one god, and that god is not an Egyptian. In this episode, we will meet the southerners. In 752 BC, Kashta, the king of Kush, dies. And Kush is then south of Egypt. It is quite unclear what Kashta actually did. For example, his great invasion of Egypt might not even have happened. So I've decided to go with the wisdom of Cambridge Ancient History, my favorite historical source. Um, they do not credit Kashta with much. much. <laughs> the kingdom of Kash uh, has its center uh, of power in Napata. You can see Napata on the map. This is between the fourth and the third cataracts of the Nile. Napata is clearly named in the sources of the new kingdom back before the Bronze Age collapse. And this city marked the southern limit of pharaonic penetration uh, south, not into Egypt, but into Kush. It may or may not be identified with Gebel Barkal, where temples were dedicated to the Theban god Amun in the 19th and 18th dynasties. This is way back. But in most things you read about this, people said Napata is Gebel Barkal, and that might not even be true. So we will have to talk a bit about Napata and about this guy, Kashta, the king of Kush. So Napata is then the capital of the new kingdom of Kush. Uh, it's impossible to reconstruct the history of the city or Kush uh, from when the Egyptians withdrew in the late 20th dynasty. There is no archaeological evidence at the site uh, between these times, and it's a period of then 300 plus years. 
So, and it seems that there wasn't the Kingdom of Kush. I mentioned the Kingdom of Kush before. There was uh, rumors of an invasion into Egypt in 950, for example. But uh, it seems that it cannot be proven that there even was a kingdom in Kush. Until right before Kashta. But the conventional view is that Inapata, the cult of a moon, went on after the Egyptians left. So they were maintaining this cult, but this probably did not happen. So this is the temple of a moon in Napata. Uh, much is made of Pai and his desire to promote the interests of a moon. Uh, Taharka runs a major building campaign, speaking about a moon all the time. Here is a quote from Pai. Pai is then the son of Kashta. You know that a moon is a god who dispatched us, using a moon as an excuse to invade Egypt. But Pi's loyalty to a moon could merely be a political advantage. It could merely be something he says, because uh, that is something the Egyptians want to hear. So worship of a moon might be very late in Kush and just be a political justification for invading Egypt. And if you look at the burials of the kings in Apata, uh, they show no signs of a moon worship. And actually, Pi himself will be buried in a totally Nubian manner, that is, in the Kush way. And he won't have any Amun things in his tomb. But the question was, what did Kashta, the king of Kush, really do? Well, his older brother, Alara, seems to have been the first king who unified Kush. And during Kashta's reign, he did something involving Egypt. And when Pi come to Thebes, uh, the Thebans are really eager to accept him and call him the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. So, at, in Pi's time, Thebes appears almost to be a vassal kingdom of Kush. So, Kashta might well have invaded Kush, but we, uh, might well have invaded Thebes and made them a vassal kingdom, but it's all very unclear. There were cultural contacts going on already in the time of Kashta, maybe before they were trading. And the rulers of Kush were very interested in Egypt because Egypt was a lot more advanced. But what Kush had that Egypt didn't have was military strength. And maybe, maybe the ruins of the new kingdom in Kush inspired the kings of Kush. But did he or did he not invade Egypt? So we know that Kashta used Katushis in his names, uh, or to include his names. Uh, that's the way of a pharaoh. And he may have assumed the Egyptian royal title, King of Upper and Lower Egypt, but he was never anywhere near Lower Egypt. Uh, we lack evidence that he invaded and conquered Thebes, but it's possible that he did. There is a fragmentary stela from Aswan bearing his name, and that one is very popular to prove that Kashta invaded Egypt, but it may even be a much later invention. Maybe a justification by a late 25th dynasty king. Well, we, pro we know uh, that Kashta probably did not make his daughter the divine adoratress of a moon in Thebes. This is a very important female position in Thebes, and we'll talk more about that, but it's, it seems that Pi was the one who did this. And I think it's time to meet Pi. I've called him the savior because he will save us from the confusion in Egypt. But actually confusion will last quite a bit longer. Here he is. And yes, he's black. The Egyptians were not black. The Egyptians were uh, pretty fair skinned. But this guy is not. He's the son of Kashta. Uh, is dating as uncertain when he becomes the king, it may be 747 BC, it's very unclear compared to, once again, Assyrian and Urartian sources. There are other names for this pharaoh, Pi or Pianki, but I will go with Pi, spelled the way <laughs> it is in the title of this page. He is normally counted as the first pharaoh of the 25th dynasty, but note that the 24th dynasty hasn't even started yet. And that's how messed Egypt is. There is a lot of people, um, they belong to different dynasties. 22nd and 23rd dynasty pharaohs are still around, but there are several of both dynasties. Pai will spend most of his time in Kush, but when he goes north, he will make quite an impression. 
Maneto, the very much later scholar, starts the 25th dynasty with Chewbacca in around 713 BC. But it's very hard to ignore Pi because he really puts this dynasty on the map. We'll talk about his action in the narrative and he will be a major help for restoring order to Egypt. In 753 BC, Jeroboam II of Israel dies and this was a golden age for Israel. He, he receives a lot of criticism in the Bible but archaeology shows that Israel was doing really great. The kingdom was powerful. You can find large well-built private houses in Tirsa, the old capital. There seems to have been a wealthy privileged class. There is much trading, especially with the Phoenicians. And Israel at this point controlled important trade routes, uh, which made the country prosperous. It's been 100 years since the Battle of Karkar, but much of Israel's wealth comes from placating the Assyrian Empire and submitting to it when it was strong and it isn't strong anymore so Israel isn't noticing the presence of the Assyrian Empire at all uh, you could almost talk about the Empire of Israel in the West in 753 BC Zechariah becomes the king of Israel this is Jeroboam the second son he's the fifth king of the dynasty of Jehu the, the dynasty has been ruling Israel for a long time it's uh, everything is going well you still have this golden age but then only six months into Zechariah's reign something happens he is murdered uh, there is a conspiracy by Shalom a captain in the king's army and he smotes Zechariah before the people according to the bible so Zechariah was the king of Israel for only six months there is a brutal coup uh, Shalom wants to start a new dynasty how long will this dynasty last? Will he be able to maintain the golden age? What was he like? What were his hobbies? Shalom, how will you be doing? Well, he didn't do very well. He is king for a month until another captain in Zechariah's army refuses to acknowledge his power. So he takes the army he controls from Tirsa to Samaria, Samaria, the capital of Israel and lay siege to Samaria. This is extremely successful. He kills Shalom and takes over. And at this point, when a usurper usurps another usurper, you know that the country is unstable. So Menahem will take measures to prevent that this happens to him. But the city of Tipsa does not acknowledge his authority as the king of Israel. So Menahem needs to do something quickly or a commander in Tipsa will probably just kill him and take over. So he does. Um, instead of waiting on another captain to march on Samaria, Menahem marches on Tipsa and he totally destroys the city. He kills all its inhabitants and he takes the pregnant women and rip them open and kill the babies. So Jehu would be proud of this guy. It's much a massacre in the style of Jehu. This means that the golden age is over. Israel is still powerful, but I get kind of bad vibrations from the Bible at this point. This could be just biblical slander. They want to make this guy look bad, but let's go with it. Okay, we have to mention that the city of Tipsa is not mentioned anywhere else, as far as I know. So. Where was it located? Why was it just invented for this story? But okay, we have Menahem. He's now the king of Israel. He has this background as a captain or general officer in the army. He knows war and he knows brutality. And maybe he's even as brutal as an Assyrian king. But this will serve him well before he comes into contact with the Assyrian. Next time, we will talk more about the 750s BC and we will get into culture and learning because the Greeks will learn how to read and write again. Remember, writing was lost during the Bronze Age collapse, but now the Greeks will learn to read and write again. Please discuss the show with me on Facebook, uh, on Twitter, visit the WordPress site. And please support the show on Patreon so I can go on to 500 BC and then do something about the Greeks in the 5th century BC and 
then maybe, maybe we could do the whole, whole Roman Empire. Thank you for watching. <laughs>